But without further ado, uh, tonight is Train Better. And again, thanks for being here on behalf of CSI Ontario uh, and myself, AJ Leaming, your host. I'll be back at the uh, the wrap up to handle some Q&A with Warren, but I'm going to sit back and enjoy along with all of you. And uh, let's introduce the uh, the guy who's going to be hot on the mic for the next little while, and that's Warren Jobbit. Warren, it's all yours. Thank you very much, AJ. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming back and joining me from uh, last week, joining us here. And um, Or if this is your first one, welcome. Uh, hopefully you get an opportunity to watch the recording from, from last week. You know, this series, as AJ mentioned, was about thinking differently, training differently in order to, to ski better. And uh, as I mentioned last week, I think the first piece of the puzzle is to ensure that we, if we're going to change our skiing, the first thing we have to do is change the way we think about skiing. And that might not be a massive change, could be something very small, but that's what's going to kickstart the, uh, the change in your skiing. Um, so we're going to talk now this week about training differently or how we go about training. Um, Dan Coyle, this, uh, an author of a book called The Talent Code, uh, is one of my favorite books. I'll give you a bit of a background about it, but one of the quotes from that book is that greatness isn't born, it's grown. And you know, one of the things that, that Mr. Mr. Coyle did is he traveled the world. He was interested in the, uh, the talent hotbeds, as he called them, where, you know, certain small towns or certain countries would produce, you know, disproportionate amount of the world's greatest athlete or soccer player or musician. And he was really curious as to what, um, you know, what sort of fueled uh, that, uh, you know, that hotbed. And as he traveled around, what was the common denominator was not so much what was in the water, um, but it was more about the, the training environment and the, uh, the hotbeds. You know, they, they had a different way of training. And so that excited me about um, how I train and how I train athletes in any sport, uh, but specifically skiing. So that's what we're going to dig into tonight is more about the training process. So last week was more about what we would train, the technical side of things. And this would be more about how we're going to train. We're going to take a look here at motivation. I think the uh, reasons for motiv motivation and what motivates you to train will definitely dictate your route and your path to developing your skiing. Motivation is number one. Then we're going to look at the philosophy of deep practice that Daniel Coyle writes about in his book um, to ensure that our practice is very specific and is a long lasting and has a, a positive training effect, a permanent training effect. We're going to look at your readiness to learn. Uh, we're going to talk about how you get yourself ready and how you train with intent. And then we're going to follow that up with some strategies about your training day. Um, so let's take a, a look. Let's start with motivation. And, you know, so I want you to take a minute here. We're going to get you involved in, in tonight's presentation because it's more of me talking than videos. So I'm hoping to keep you awake by uh, having you answer some polls. But my first question here for you, and, and take a moment to think about it, and then AJ is going to pop up the poll in a second. And I want you to ask yourself, what is your motivation for training? Why are you going to train this winter? Is it for certification? Is that your primary goal for training? Or is it simply to just be the best that you can be? All right. So why don't you can jump into the to the poll right now, take 30 seconds, pop it in. Curious to see where everybody's at uh, in this one. And Warren, that uh, poll is live now. Perfect. And if anybody's having trouble finding that, you can, uh, at the top of your chat bar, you will see chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. You click on polls, uh, you've got that up now. So Warren, uh, not yep. sure if you're looking at results, but you've got 4% uh, are, uh, are here to be the best that they can be. <laughs> uh, we've got 19% currently that are looking towards certification. Fantastic. Well done. And, you know, there is no right or wrong answer, right? We all have our different reasons for training. And there was there was a time in, in my uh, skiing career, my professional career, where I would have certainly answered certification, right? Um, I'm trying to get my level two, three, four, 
uh, maybe make the inner ski team, um, whatever that might be, right? So certification at times definitely was my primary motivation for getting out there on the cold days when the snow is blowing and it's not great conditions, but I still force myself out the door. Um, the other one though, and, and later on in my career uh, has shifted over more just to be the best that I can be. So when we look at uh, the research behind motivation, um, it's you know, part of human nature for us to be curious, right? It's uh, part of human nature for us to initiate thought and behavior to make meaning from experience, to be effective at what we value. And this is inherent in all of us, right? This is something that, that we all have. Um, me, primarily, I find myself curious. Why do I continue to train? Why do I still have that desire to be the best that I can be? And it's that little slip on the icy patch. It's the, uh, you know, skiing down something steeper and trying to maybe go a little bit faster, uh, trying to ski the bump run uh, a little bit more down the hill. It, for me, it's more curiosity that feeds my motivation. And when curiosity feeds your motivation, when um, these types of, of uh, you know, reasons to, to train the, the sources of motivation uh, are your key, then we tend to uh, have a little bit more success in the sense that uh, because there isn't a pass or a fail, there isn't a success or no success. And one of the, I was just watching, um, you know, I watch a lot of the World Cup and, you know, Michaela Schifrin is one of those people that, you know, she's won so many, uh, you know, podiums and, and so many first place gold medals. And, um, but, you know, the, recently she just ran the, her first downhill in, in quite a while. And, um, you know, it, uh, her motivation was to just, I'm getting stuff popping up here, sorry, um, was just to get back on the downhill track. And I think she, in her first downhill, she placed sixth. And then there's a video of her uh, social media, her dancing in the finish line and happy as can be and happy for the others who happen to be better than her that day. Of course, we all, if we're racing, we want to win. But if our target is to be the best that we can be and we happen to succeed at being the best that we can be, but somebody else was just a little bit better than us that day, or if the, the standard that you're searching for your level two, your level three, your level four is maybe a little bit higher than where you were that day at the best that you can be. It's still a very successful approach and it's a more positive way to train. So motivation, number one. Um, and if you take that philosophy and that understanding of motivation and you flip it from you and your training to your students, hey, okay, when the learners that you're working with can see that what they're learning makes sense, right? And it's important um, to them and their success, then they become motivated to learn from you. And that's really important for buy-in in your lessons, right? So our, um, so our students have you know, complete buy-in and trust in their ski instructor. And that's the most important part behind any lesson. So, you know, tactically there, that's when we talk to our students and we do this all the time, right? What do you, what do you want out of this lesson? and actively listen to their response in the way they respond, their body language. And, you know, if they're very nervous and it's just to control their speed when they get onto a steeper pitch, could you imagine that if you refer to that as you're introducing a certain movement, right, in their training, you say, well, here's what we're going to add, right? And that is going to help you slow down. It's going to help you control your speed. You're going to be fine sort of thing. Um, then that, if it makes sense to them, that all clearly it's important to them because it was part of their initial goal uh, in which they shared that with you, then they're going to be motivated to try what it is you're asking them to do 100%. So I wonder the let's pop up the second poll here now, AJ. There we go. So um, before you answer this one real quickly, right? That, um, you know, training, when you're training, uh, to be the best that you can be. That's an intrinsic motivator, right? That's the, I'm curious. I'm trying to make meaning of this situation. Uh, you know, this experience that I just had, why did I slow down? Why didn't I slow down? Why did my turn get shorter? Why didn't it get shorter? Why did I get more grip? Why didn't I get more grip? That's intrinsic motivation. 
Okay. That's the being the best that you can be. Extrinsic motivation is that reward, right? So I'm skiing for, I'm, I'm training to get that, you know, yellow pin, red pin, blue pin. Um, maybe it's, hey, if I get my next level certification, I get a raise at my snow school, something like that. But that's an extrinsic motivator. So I want you to now, based on what we just talked about motivation, how do you view your motivation at this point? Is for training. Is it more intrinsic or extrinsic? Go for it. Pop it in. Take 30 seconds and make your decision. So Warren, early uh, early responses are heavily intrinsic. We do Excellent. have a few uh, a few that are extrinsically motivated this evening, which is great. Absolutely. And um, and to your earlier question, we now we have most of the room has uh, responded. So a lot of people this evening looking to improve um, themselves, but 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 a healthy chunk, sixteen percent, looking towards certification. Fantastic. And you know what? If that's your goal, you know, and a lot of us are, and it's hard to. You know, and I didn't give you the option to say um, both, right? Uh, because you, you know, one will feed the other. There is a sequence to that. Uh, because you know, for me, if I'm trying to be the best that I can be, and uh, I continue to train, there's a good chance at some point that maybe I will reach my next level of certification, right? If you're gunning for a level of certification and that's your main motivation that I want to get the next level. Uh, at some point, hopefully, our skiing is going to continue to develop as well. Okay, but this, you know, the idea of motivation coming a little bit more intrinsically, um, more about a lifelong or a season-long uh, journey to development, uh, falls a little bit more in line with the way that we're looking at training here tonight. And uh, because this is not a there's no timeline on on our training, this is a, a way and a, a system for training. So Daniel Coyle coins the, the, the term deep practice in, in his novel. And it's uh, something that I've, I think I always knew, you know, when you start talking about those 10,000 hours and, you know, practice, 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 practice makes perfect. Uh, but when we take a deep dive onto deep practice, uh, the, the funny part about deep practice is the deep practice is about pushing yourself to the limits of your ability. And what happens in that point when you're kind of wavering on the current state of your, you know, highest point of your ability is we tend to make mistakes. And it's when we make mistakes, so I call them the oh no matter moments, uh, when you say, oh, geez, what happened there? I have no idea. That's where that curiosity, that motivation, uh, that, you know, the, the internal sort of curiosity about, wow, what was that all about? How can I control my speed? How can I get... Uh, you know, a bit more of a carved arc as opposed to a less carved arc. So that's what deep practice is, is really about. The key factor, first and foremost, is about finding that limit. Um, I find a lot of skiers, I see it at, you know, I travel all over the country and you see a lot of ski instructors out uh, and, and athletes too, um, training. And they tend to, I see, a, what I see a lot is they'll ski the same run, a nice, beautiful, groomed blue slope. And they'll do the same size turn, same speed over and over and over. And while they're doing that, they might be thinking about uh, feedback that they got from their course conductor, from their uh, morning session. Uh, they might be thinking about it, but there's really no training effect going on because they're really well within that comfort zone. What I want to stress on this one, though, is that when I, we talk about getting to the edges of your ability, it's all within the realm of safety. Right. So it's not about going out there and going faster and faster and faster. Speed uh, could be a factor in reaching the edge of our ability, uh, but also challenging your turn shape. Can you make your turn shape tighter? Right. That would be at the edge of your ability. You know, going a shorter turn than what you've ever done before. Right. Adding in some variability, switching from carved to less carved arcs. You know, that would also be pushing uh, the limits or the edges of your ability. So it doesn't just mean speed and going for it all the time. So there's three rules to deep practice. Number one, chunk it up. Okay. And what that means is um, we take pieces, you know, uh, you know, take what we're working on, find a piece and continue and train that piece. But the first moment that we want before we break it down, the first thing we have to do is see a series or a, a, a bigger area 
uh, of where this move applies. So I kind of look at two bigger chunks being platform creation. So how I create my platform, be it turn the skis, tip the skis, and then how that drain or changes our direction, changes our momentum on an arc would kind of be the other piece of the puzzle that I look at. Now within both of those larger chunks, there are smaller pieces. We could be talking about a very refined uh, bit of balance, a slight uh, bend here or there, a little bit more uh, distribution of pressure closer to the front of your boot than the back of your boot. So those are the little pieces. But if we don't know what the little piece is going to do for us, then uh, in relative to the bigger part, then we tend to get a little bit sidetracked and we can go way too far. We can say, swing the pendulum from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum because we can train a move for the sake of the move or we can train a move for the sake of platform creation, a series of moves or a chunk of the arc, and then direction change as well. One of the other things that I encourage people in one of my tactics that I use is slowing it down. How slow can you make a particular move, but still do it right? Um, a dear friend of mine, B, her name is B down in Fernie. Uh, she's a physiotherapist. Uh, she's also a Tai Chi instructor. And we talked a lot about this. I, I did a drill with her uh, where I asked her to ski as slow as she possibly could and still stay parallel. And it was on a, an average blue run, a groomed blue run, let's say. And one of the things that it did is you can really realize and recognize right away whether you're a slight bit out of balance because there's not a ton of, you know, external forces that are going to hold you up. You know, there's not a big edged ski to to balance against so you have to create your balance just through the way that you move your body we talked about um then we related it to to tai chi which was really interesting and if you know tai chi it's a very you know it's a martial art um but it's very slow moving you've probably seen people outside on the beach in the park in the summer doing it and here's i want you to do something for me i'm going to show you and then i want you to give it a try okay so what you're going to do is you're going to hold your your arm out like this. And all I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to raise your hand up, your fist up this way. So you're pointing straight up and then raise your hand into the air. All right. So I want you to well, join me now as we do this. And I can't see if you're doing it. So I'm just going to pretend that we're all participating. But <laughs> right. So from here, as slow as you possibly can, I want you to start to raise your fist in the air. And I can start feeling different muscles at different times starting to act in my arm as I do that down in here now as I go up right up in here down in here and I can feel those muscles and then lay it bring it back down again okay you can actually sense the different muscles and the orders that they fire in a kinetic chain okay so now what I want you to do is you go back to here again and what you're going to do is you're just going to go straight up and up as fast as you possibly can and try to compare the sensation internally. If I go from here and straight up, at the very end, I feel tension and, and engagement of some muscles. But through the motion itself, I actually don't feel them. So that's something that this type of drill does for us. It's that chunking things up a little bit. Break it down and you know try to use a slow motion as fast as much as you can and what that will do for you is it's going to bring you inside internally you're going to notice balance uh, fires and misfires uh, and you might even sense that you're about to lose your balance as you go through it so there's rule number one let's check out rule number two rule number two repeat it <laughs> uh, research shows that uh, most world-class experts practice three to five hours a day, and that's a ton, right? Uh, I know that not all of us uh, get on, are on snow five days a week. Uh, sometimes we don't get three to five hours. Maybe we spend most of our day teaching, uh, hopefully, and uh, so we don't always get a ton of time to, to train. But if you think back to the previous rule, the working on the chunks, working as slow as you can, can you imagine now every snowplow lesson that you teach, every novice intermediate lesson that you teach, you can be training your skiing all the time. 
one of my favorite uh, sayings is if you're standing around you're working on your teaching if you're moving you're working on your skiing so one of my philosophies here is what i've done with my training camps what i found the most success over the years is a three-hour training block really really works well and the reason for the three-hour training block uh number one is it gives you time to just be you know to have your students become comfortable with you be comfortable with the their surroundings the snow the weather of the day uh, group lessons which a lot of us are teaching right um, just to become comfortable within the group itself takes time and then from there when people start to become comfortable then you can start talking about a different concept or a different way to think about skiing and they'll be able to focus their attention on that they're starting to gain that that trust that we talked about and then from there they start to try right they start to experience new feelings they get to experience the fact that wow i can slow down at will <laughs> uh, for the first time uh, those types of things and that for i find that's about the two hour mark uh, in my day where we we build up we get activated uh, ready to learn activated physically uh, cognitively emotionally and then try something get some new sensations and what happens is if you cut it off at two hours and you go inside for your lunch um, to get back to that point again after lunch, after you've sat down, um, people are you know drained sometimes at that point uh, mentally because they've been thinking a lot harder than they normally would when they're skiing because you're asking them to try something new. Um, you never really get your students back to that same level of activation so i draw out that extra hour uh again if weather and all that uh, depending but um you know and you get that last hour where you can really start to experience the results of your new actions maybe you get an opportunity to vary them maybe you try a shorter turn maybe you go flatter maybe you go a bit steeper okay maybe you even try to bring it into the bumps and then that's taking yourself and trying new variations with one particular move and that there will give you that. That's that deep practice, um, that philosophy that we're talking about here tonight. Uh, rule number three. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is learn to feel it. And I have a crazy, and this just came to me uh, when I would when I was thinking about this. Um, my I have a 23-year-old daughter, Sierra, and she at a young age started to play piano. And I remember her going through it and she would play and it wouldn't sound like a song at all. Uh, she would be reading, you know, the music and hit the, the notes and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, so it didn't always sound like a song, but then all of a sudden she started to turn it into a song. And I recognized that, you know, I had the opportunity once, uh, you know, wondering how it went from just banging the keys on the piano to an actual song. And so I had the opportunity to, Kind of hang out in the background of, of some of her piano lessons and her piano teacher did this she started to she got sierra to hum the song first so the teacher and if it wasn't a song that sierra knew um, the teacher would hum it for her then she'd hear the song and she'd hear the full piece right going back two rules ago right knowing the the bigger picture and then as she started to play she would recognize when she made a mistake because it didn't sound like the song that she knew she was trying to to play. Um, it wasn't always perfectly timed, but she could start catching herself. So you should be able to notice in your skiing that when things don't go well, um, you should notice that you need to be able to notice that feeling. And we're going to talk a little bit more about sensations and balance and thing in a minute. But and but you can't ignore it. Right. You have to actually go through it <laughs> and stop recognize what you're trying to do what it does within the whole picture and then try again and when we do that that starts to cue in again the you know that you know kind of thinking learning from that experience making meaning of the experience why does it feel like this why does the song sound like that um you know that's it the, and then you know what if i and then the curiosity piece right what if i did that same maybe it's maybe i just did it too late Maybe I did it too much. Maybe I didn't do it enough. 
And that's that curiosity. And again, then we get into motivation. So um, let's pop up the next poll here, AJ. So what we're looking for on this one then, um, thinking to deep practice, right? What is your key takeaway from those three rules? Was it the absorb the whole piece and then chunk it up? Was it repeat it? You know, the three hour training block philosophy, or was it the learn to feel? Which of those three hits home with you? What If you're going to take one piece of that deep practice with you and go out on snow tomorrow, which one is it going to be? Go for it. Throw in your answers. Ooh. All right. Oh, we're sorry. We're the learn to feel it piece. I love that. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. So, you know, and I, I think the same way. And it, um, you know, that that's the piece that uh, I focus on mostly in my training. Um, going back to my piano story real briefly, um, I also have uh, the joy of having a five-year-old daughter in my house who's also banging away on the, uh, on the, on the piano. And when, you know, I noticed she, and Alex, my wife is a wonderful piano player. And so, um, you know, Alex would play the music for her first, Natalie would hear it and she'd be able to, to follow through with it. So, you know, that sound, knowing the whole song, the whole picture first, and then following through with it is a big, big step forwards in our training. So are you ready to learn? Okay. So this is that readiness to learn component or piece. And, um, I, going back to that, that description I said earlier, where I see a lot of pros just kind of hitting the same run, you know, day in, day out, same speed, same turn shape, trying to learn. For me, that's just, you know, walking, you know, standing on a moving sidewalk in the airport and just mindlessly, you know, moving forwards uh, towards your gate. Um, in order for us to learn, to really be ready to learn, you have to think it. Okay. And that's last week's session, right? I need to be able to understand what it is ski technique is that's my target i need to learn right so that means i have to break it down i have to go through my deep practice philosophy and build upon my experiences that i had right um, if you're not going through that pace and you're just skiing as far as training and trying to get to the next level then you know i think we're kind of wasting our time out there i think we could have a better experience. Now, I'm not saying that every second of every day you should be focused and thinking about your skiing um, if you just want to go out and have a great ski day. Uh, but if you want to actually develop and change your skiing and train to the next level, um, then this is this is kind of the approach that we have to take or else we'll just kind of flatline uh, our development. So intensity. I use this every day myself. Uh, I use this minimum three times a day. I use it before I get on snow. I use it after my first sort of uh, couple of runs. I use it just before lunch. I use it at near the end of the day, you know, as it's getting later on in the day. Um, but here's a check-in that I want you to, to, to think. And this is, all, this is in the handout, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. Um, but I have three pieces to my check-in, which then determine what intensity level I'm going to train at so I'm at the edge of my ability. Remember going way back to the beginning of our talk here tonight. Number one is physical. And at uh, my young age of 51, uh, <laughs> I find every day there possibly could be a different part of my body that uh, just isn't moving the way it was uh, the day before. So that's my, that's my physical check-in. Um, my cognitive check-in, that is, do I clearly understand what move I'm trying to make? where I'm trying to make it and what it's supposed to do for me and what it might feel like. Do I know those pieces of the puzzle? If not, then I'm probably going to have to change my intensity level of training. The third piece then combined those two, uh, the psychological component. And, you know, after breaking my leg, I had a lot of that uh, in there where, you know, I was afraid, I was, I was scared. Um, and sometimes now, even when my, um, when my one or two there, uh, are not you know very high on my scale of say one to ten. 
um, then I get nervous and uh, I'm not super confident uh, in my skiing. But that's the reality of it. But I can still train. I can still get a training effect from my day. So let's say I get out in the morning and from a scale from one to 10, completely subjective <laughs> uh, scale and everybody's four out of 10 will be, will be different. But for me personally, when, you know, if I got out there and physically I'm feeling a four, I, my knees sore today. Uh, I'm not, you know, my legs are tired from the previous day. Uh, let's say I score myself on a four out of 10, but on number two there, I do know what I want to train. I know the move I want to make. I know what it's supposed to feel like. I know where what my skis are going to do, how much, you know, if I'm going to go fast you know, on the arc or anything like that, with the result of that particular move. And so, you know, even though I might be physically not feeling it, but cognitively, you know, a 10 out of 10, overall, I might say, okay, well, how confident am I here today uh, on, my, on my skis? Maybe it's a six. Okay. That doesn't mean that I can't train. It means that maybe I choose a green run today. Maybe I choose to develop the particular move I need uh, on a less carved arc. You know, maybe not laying it over quite as much. Maybe not looking for as much ski performance out of it. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like we spoke last week, the movements that we have in our skiing are global for every turn shape, uh, every speed that we're going to go. So I can still have... A training effect. I can reach my edges of my uh, uh, ability. I can operate at the edges of my ability, uh, regardless of where my numbers are. Okay, let's move along here. Warren, I uh, I threw yeah. an additional question in the polls for you there, and just had some interesting responses. And the question that was asked was, "What are some factors you're aware of that impact your ready to train status?" You know, I gave examples like distractions, fatigue, mood, etc. And I don't know if, sure if you're looking at the responses, but a lot of people commenting on things like fatigue, mood, energy level. <laughs> and uh, the other one that I would pull out is uh, a few mentions of coming back from injury, you know, so the the cautiousness or the uh, the concern about re-injury, that sort of thing. So just to, to sort of pick up your um, your theme on on training and being ready to train and awareness. Mm -hmm. um, some really interesting responses there for you in the uh, in the poll. Yeah, that's fantastic, everyone. Thank you for participating. This is awesome. <laughs> you know, and and you know that the, you're you're absolutely right. And um, I I can you know speak from experience in the past that there were days when I chose not to train when I was training for the level my level four as an example uh, because ah the light was flat. And I wanted, I, I thought at the time that training for the level four certification meant going, you know, a uh, hundred kilometers an hour all the time, uh, hitting the biggest bumps possible all the time. Um, and, you know, just putting in the miles and I, I can say I put in a lot of miles. Um, but I, if I think back, uh, I can say for certain that I was not always operating at the edges of, of my ability at the time and you know look at things like this your your mood the cold um distractions maybe somebody just cut you off and you know all of a sudden you you're you're not thinking uh, anymore you know that that number two point here the cognitive side of things um kind of changes where your level of intensity might be so i personally now if i'm working on my skiing i check in on these three points every single run uh, and it can, you knowingly that it can change partway down the run too, right? So this should be running in the background, you know, it's like a computer program, just running in the background, helping you make your decisions uh, as to how you're going to approach your training day. All right, so let's get training. Number one, fit the small parts into the hole. <laughs> know the hole. And I this is a great uh, sort of analogy where if you're standing back, looking at skiing you know, or you know the, the platform creation direction change or the whole arc in general and then you zoom your camera lens into a part of the body a part of the turn what it's doing what it's doing for you and then you zoom back out to make sure that our understanding continues to build higher and higher so you're constantly zooming that lens in and out and like i said we don't want to get stuck too deep on any one of those so i've got a video here uh, that I put together when I was just in Fernie the last couple of days. 
and um, it's going to take you through uh, my process in uh, in training something for my own skiing that day. So give me one second, you'll get it playing here. Hey everyone, you know what I'm developing in my skiing right now is that platform creation. And it was really important for me to build that platform so I've got to be in a stance that allows me to have my glutes engaged and use the uh, muscles that are going to most efficiently and effectively create that platform for me. So some of the key aspects here is one, I need to feel my glutes engaged. I need to notice that when I roll my ski over that I feel balanced between my first met head and also my heel pad while maintaining uh, some shin contact as well. Um, when I do that, then the shovel's going to, you know, the ski's going to bend, um, the shovel's going to bend and pull me around the corner. I don't have to move forward on the front of the ski for something like that, because uh, when I tip the ski over, it bends and stay in the middle of it, it's going to bend and do what I need it to do. So here's how I train something like that. First and foremost, I need to know the move and where I make the move start. So I'm going to cue myself into that by saying now or whatever I say it out loud. Uh, I can tap my leg when I'm about to, to make that move. So I actually notice and cue into my, my learning that, uh, that I'm making the move. And then from there, I'm going to sense those three points of contact. Okay, and I'm going to measure them and go, oh, that's a bit more on the heel pad, a bit more on the met head, and make sure that I'm not losing any of those three points of contact. And then from there, I also need to know, what is this move supposed to do for me? And I need to measure the results of that move relative to my turn objective. So as I build a platform that's a little bit more edge, get that ski tip out to its side, the ski should bend, it should be more carved, right? Um, but also on top of that, the ski should you know, create a nice tight arc for me so I'm not traveling down the hill too far that I might redirect myself in and out of the fall line in the shortest period possible down the mountain. To me, that would be my definition of expert skiing. So come take a ride with me on this one, and uh, I'm gonna just, you know, I'm gonna coach you through what's happening to me at the time, and uh, this is how we need to train to be um, aware of what's going on and uh, and to actually learn as we're moving along. All right, so here we go. Um, so I'm gonna stay nice and low through transition and get that glute engaged, roll the ski over. I'm gonna roll the ski over nice and early so I get the ski to grip. Okay, so that's the action. I need to know the action so I can actually then start to measure the results of that action. So I should feel, you know, my heel pad, but also up on my med head, you know, and as I roll the ski over, probably a bit more like 60% med head, 40% heel. Okay? That should get the ski to tip over and bite. Okay, so let's measure a couple of these. Oh, there I lost my heel. I actually got too far up onto the med head. All right, that one there, down. I got that one. There we go, bit better, 60-40, you know, kind of med head, heel pad. And, oh, that was more heel pad on that one. Okay, so you gotta recognize that. And, you know, when I got on that heel pad just a little bit too much, then what happened is I ended up not getting the tip of the ski to grab the snow, and it was a less carved arc. Okay, so when I sense that ski bending, you know, I can't really feel the ski bend, but my turn shape gets me around the corner much quicker. You know, the way less vertical drop. So there's a good one. There's a good one there. Now what I'm going to do is I shift my thinking from, instead of thinking of the move and what it's supposed to feel like and what it does for me, now I coach myself to use that move. So looking at the terrain down below here, you know, ahead of time, I'm thinking, oh, right now it's gonna get steeper, so I gotta be faster how much I roll the, the ski over, right? I'm gonna be more aggressive by tipping that ski over because I still want it to be a carved arc, but I don't want to get going too fast. 
down this slope. And now it starts to flatten out a little bit. So I'm just going to, the rate that I roll the ski over is going to be a little bit more gradual. Instead of a one, two count, it's a one, two, three count. Okay, and then we start utilizing our skills. So let's tighten one up here. Because I have to tip it over more and I have to tip it over faster. And now I'm going to draw it out so it'll be a bit more progressive and maybe not tip it over quite as much. Okay, there you go. Sorry about the, yeah, the, I know there's a lot of wind and, and stuff, but hopefully you got the, uh, the idea there uh, as, to, as to what's going through my head. You know, we know the little pieces of the puzzle, what we're doing, why we're doing them, and, uh, and move on from there. So we're going to look here. So, you know, this is the identification of uh, what you might want to add to your ski, right? So that, you know, all training has to start <laughs> with some sort of gap right we got to try and you know there's there's a gap between where you are where you want to be that's a move that we need to develop in your skiing to fill that gap so number one you're skiing down did i achieve the objective as set out right and if the answer is no then we're, well what was the ski doing was it skidding too much um you know was it hooking up at the end was it tossing me for you know out of the arc a little bit uh was i balanced on that arc how did it feel internally you know, and they go, wow, like I mentioned on one there, I was right back on on, on the heel pad. Um, and so and then as a result, what move is missing, right? And this identification of this, you know, bridging that gap, um, that it can be from yourself. You can watch yourself on video. Uh, for most of us, it's usually, you know, at, during a, a session, um, it's uh, on a CSIA course or a PD day, something like that, right? So once we identify a move that we want to put in, then we reverse this order, okay? So now this is the add component to our training. So we reverse and say, okay, what move am I adding? How might it feel internally? When I say internally, um, some people are really good at sensing, you know, different muscle groups that are, are engaged. Uh, others are, are not. Um, but we can all sort of feel the bottom of our feet, that, you know, the metatarsal head, the heel pad, it's super easy to feel the, the shin uh, on the front of the boat. Those are contact points. And it's pretty hard to, to ski incorrectly movement-wise and still be balanced on those three points of contact. Um, number three, what effect does it have on the, on the arc? So, you know, it's one thing to know what the move is, where to do it, what it's going to feel like. But if there's no defined target, as I say down here, the objective, then what's really the point to doing it? And I use the example, if I was to teach somebody how to throw darts, right? There's mechanics behind it, how to hold the dart, how to stand, you know, how to release the dart and that sort of thing. But if I have them throwing the dart against a, just a blank wall, they may be able to get the movements correct, but how are you ever going to identify uh, whether or not they're doing it as efficiently or effectively as possible if you don't have the dartboard up. So we need to be able to define our target as clear as a dartboard and the bullseye. And the more clear you can make that bullseye uh, as a result of the move that they're making, the better chance we're going to be able to measure the results of their actions and slowly or, as, or quickly refine those actions until we hit the bullseye. And so now we've got a skill that we want to build. We know the, the target from it. And I've got, for every move, I've got three dials. Number one is where, right? We can move that dial, I, you know, kind of a dimmer switch uh, dial, um, where you can move that, you know, that movement, uh, maybe a bit early, ski length earlier, or ski length later, and that's going to have an effect on your turn shape. You can take that move and you can do it more or you can do it less. That also, the degree, will also have an effect on your turn shape. And the third one being the rate. I can make any move quickly or I can make it a bit more progressive. And that too is going to have an effect on my outcome on the turn shape. Okay? When we start moving these dials, we only do one at a time. And when we do one at a time and we internally assess what the results were, 
did I hit my bullseye? Yes or no? <laughs> did I have those, my three points of contact or whatever internal feeling it is that you were attempting at the time? That helps us create what I call if then scenarios. Because as soon as you log that data, say, oh, well, if I make this move a little sooner, then the result of my turn shape is X. If I make this particular move, if I keep the where in the same spot, and now I go to the degree and I make this move a little bit more, ah, that's what happens to my turn shape. If I keep the where and the degree dials constant and I change the rate, I do it faster, I do it a bit more progressive. Oh, look at this. Now I'm traveling more across the hill or whatever it might be. If then scenarios is what we start to log through our training process. So let's learn. Right? Number one, be curious. Why? What happened there? And it's not about to, we don't overanalyze it, but it should cue you into what am I going to do next? Right? I'm old enough. I've had enough life experiences. I know that I can't change the past, but I can be curious about it to affect the future. So through logging your results on our training, you know, that changing your dials, if then scenarios, then that can help us draw meaning from our experience. The if then scenarios will then also help us become more skillful. As I mentioned in that video, it's using a motor pattern or a motor skill uh, to direct where I want to go. I mean, watching ahead, if I want to go over a steeper pitch or I end up going over a steeper pitch, I automatically know where to set my dials to achieve the speed control that I'm looking for at the time. And that's becoming skillful with the skills that you have. And there's, like we said last week, there's not a ton of different things you can do to be efficient and effective on your skis. Real quickly, let's look at the end user, all right? John Wooden, a, uh, an NCAA coach, um, basketball coach in the U.S., he, uh, he's you've seen, I've seen studies on, on him. He's one of the most winningest coaches in NCAA history. And here are the key things from John Wooden. Um, when he speaks, it's short, right? It's punctuated. It's very specific and comes with a, you know, a real punch to the face sort of idea. Um, and numerous, he gives numerous times, right? Um, he doesn't lecture. He doesn't speak more than 20 seconds. Right? Um, there's three-part instruction is how he does things. And this is a pretty cool way to do it. Um, adults need to know why. So if you're going to ask them to do something different in their skiing, there's that ad adult learning principle of the need to know. So what he does is he models the right way. Here's what we're going to do. He shows you an incorrect way, maybe the way that it has been done in the past, and then remodels the right way again. Okay, so you kind of say, here's what we're going to do. See, this is, you know, a way that, you know, we have been skiing and then boom, hit them again with what it is that you want them to do. Demonstrations and relative to skiing, uh, these would be static demos, right? Where you're standing there in front of your client, three seconds, make it short. You don't need to repeat it a hundred times, show them and go. Okay? But the clarity of it, you, when you're demonstrating has to be so obvious the movement that you're making that your students can't not see the new move that you're asking them to do. Teach an entire move, break it down to work on its essential or elements um, and elemental actions, right? So, you know, that's that looking at the whole, find the piece, the real, you know, pure piece that you need added to your puzzle. And then from there, build it back in to the whole. And we've had that in our system, the whole part, whole theory has been there. Uh, it's in, and it's still this, it's everywhere in, in outstanding coaching. You're going to see that. So make sure we do that with our students. We master ski teachers, we possess vast deep frameworks of knowledge, which we apply to the steady incremental work of growing skill circuits in our students, which ultimately we don't control. And so, you know, it, and that, that's the reality of teaching. You imagine in your own training, you have total control. And so take that philosophy, the philosophies from this evening, and understand that no matter what we do, how we present it, the, the clearer the, the bullseye is, there's a better chance that our students are going to achieve the goal earlier or faster in the lesson. Um, but we don't control that because they are responsible for the learning piece. And make that known. You, know, you can teach anybody anything but it's their responsibility to learn. And if you go, if you're verbal about this and open about your own training, um, then that's gonna teach them how to train 
at the same time. So everything you do with your own, so your own training for our training philosophy here this evening, it's no different with your students. You have to share this type of plan with them so they will get to the results much, much faster. So motivation, key. Why are you here? Why are you training? Fall into the deep practice system of, of training. Uh, operate at the edges of your ability level. Practice over, practice over. Know what the full picture looks like and work on the pieces within it. Hum the song before you play it on your guitar. Readiness to learn. Do you, you know, go through your checklist, one, two, and three, physically, cognitively, psychologically, how confident am I today? Make a choice to train with intent all the time. Use these training strategies at the end that we were talking about to, uh, to have a little bit more success. And I've got one more poll here for you, and we'll open it up for questions. What movie did I have a reference to this evening? So this one's not uh, not very uh, technical at all. Off you go. Come on, toss it in there. Take a guess if you don't know. Well, well there's definitely guesses because there's Top Gun and Spinal Tap running even right now, Warren. 50-50. We're 50-50. Come on, throw in it. Oh, Top Gun. Come on, I got to watch Top Gun again. I'll take us back to the slide where it was. I'll give you a hint here, everybody. Ta-da. Spinal Tap. Go to YouTube, Google Spinal Tap, turn it to 11, and you'll have a good chuckle over that one. Anyways, just a little bit of fun to end the evening. Um, you know, I wanted to bring up one thing. I've had a lot of people reach out to me about the Mont St. Anne camp with the recent uh, developments at Mont St. Anne. We are working on a plan B. Um, the camp is definitely going to run. Uh, we have a couple of location options out there for us. I'm just working through uh, that right now. So if you're still thinking of registering, please do, uh, because it is going to run. It'll be in the general vicinity of Mont St. Anne. Uh, hopefully, and uh, but I'll be getting back to you guys on social media. If you're not following me on Facebook or uh, Instagram, uh, try and find me and, and jump in there because uh, that's where you'll get the latest and greatest information on that and any camps uh, coming forward. Here's my email address, my website and phone number. Please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Awesome, Warren. Uh, thanks so much again for this evening and uh, to the gang in the audience now we've got a little over 100 on the line. Um, we are opening things up for questions. So if you do have uh, any questions, we'll give you a moment just to get those posted up. Uh, use the Q&A tab and I'll post those live as they come in. Um, it, it can be a question relating tonight. It could be something that you've picked up over the last two sessions. Um, but anything that you feel is, uh, you know, in, in Warren's realm of influence, if he's able to give us a hand or, or reflect on what we've talked about tonight, that's fantastic. Um, I've got one question in so far. I'll post that up. So Warren, Joel posted a question. Curious to know what the understanding or relationship between uh, Grand Reaction Force basis support and center of mass. <laughs> maybe you can ramble for a moment and uh and help joel out with that yeah oh there it is now i see the now i see the question um we think of the best way to to go with this okay here's a good one all right so i'm going to use my leg break uh example for you so um i was at sun peaks skiing as fast as i can ski groom blue run and uh full-on uh Angles after the fall line where the forces uh, tend to be the greatest, or the, where I would sense the ground reaction, reaction force being the greatest. The snow sinks, shallow skis bend, and I crush my femur uh, down onto my tibial plateau. Boom, done, right? Um, then I start to cartwheel. I feel, apparently three of them. I didn't, I could, I didn't count. <laughs> Observers did for me. So um, when at the moment when there, I know for sure one point, in my cartwheel, my head hit the ground because I can still remember the sound of that. Um, at that very moment, if you took a still shot, right, where my head is on the ground, that would be my base of support. That's the one thing of me uh, that is in contact with the snow at that given moment in time. 
Um, if you were to draw uh, the the line from you know through my base of support through my center of mass, it would be aligned directly with the ground reaction force at that time. Now, I'm not going to say that that's awesome technique and that we should all be out there um, cartwheeling to test the theory. Um, but that's, you know, if um, at any moment when your whatever is your base of support is supporting your center of mass, it'll always be in line with the ground reaction force. So and that's the, you know, the resultant force is the ground reaction force is what we feel. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with technique necessarily, because that statement is always true, right? In the sense that the ground reaction force is always aligned to the base of support center mass. We may be out of position. It may not be the most efficient and effective way to stand on our skis, um, but that's just, a, it's just a statement uh, relations. You know, if you're to draw arrows and you draw want to draw lines on things, um, then that's what it would look like. Hopefully that answers the question. You can always reach out to me in private too. We can have a, a long conversation too. I'm happy to do so, Joel. Awesome. Thanks, Warren. Um, not a lot of other Q&A tonight, which uh, the, the crowd's going easy on you. Um, lots of thank yous in the chat. So really appreciate the time. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of give it a, a three, two, one count. If you've got other questions, feel free to post them in. I will, uh, I'll start our sort of concluding remarks though, and then we'll, we'll look to see if there's any questions before we wrap. Um, tonight was number two of three part Tech Talk series to kick off the season. Um, Tech Talk, this format will be available as, as CSI Ontario um, gains access to additional presenters. Um, we will be posting out new content whenever we can. Um, if you've signed up for a, um, a tech talk series or, or a single event in the past, you'll always get an email invite to an upcoming session. So uh, keep an eye open for those as the season goes on. Uh, the next evening is coming to you on the 21st of December. So just before Christmas. Um, and it'll be again at eight o'clock in the evening. And the invites via email should go out for that on uh, probably either Sunday afternoon to tomorrow afternoon or Monday. Um, it, I am seeing a few questions pop up now, so uh, I'll, I'll post those up Warren and then we can, uh, we can chip away at answering those questions. Um, Rob asked a question about, is there a handout from tonight? So if you click on the handouts tab, you will, uh, you'll find your handout there, Rob. Um, and there's a handout for this evening. And then next week on the 21st, when we gather again, we will, um, we'll be posting out a quick handout for session number one. We'll post up tonight's again, as well as uh, a little bit of a summary of number three. Um, next questions. Um, link to the recording of the session. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. So if you've signed up and you uh, you were here tonight, you'll automatically receive a link following the session. You'll get a little bit of a, a survey as you exit on what you thought of the evening. And then um, following that, once the recording uploads, you'll receive access to that online. Um, next question I'm going to post up is um, from Jennifer. How do you address the fear of practicing the wrong way for three hours? Um, I'll, I'll leave that with you, Warren. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good, that's a very interesting question. The fear of practicing the wrong way. Um, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, the, I think if you know, first and foremost, you, you need to know um, the movement pattern, right? That, that it is that you're trying to, to ingrain or add uh, to your skiing. Um, I think if you have the, uh, not I think, sorry, I know that when you have that internal sensation, you know, the, the, you know, what the, what the, where the pressure would be more inside ski, outside ski, more mat head, more heel pad, what it might be. It's pretty hard to go too far sideways on that, right? If you go to those, if you're in contact with those three points of contact at all times, you're going to be balanced. If it's in the middle of the, on the outside ski, um, you're going to definitely be in control and you can't be going too far wrong at that point. The final piece to measure is, is that 
addition to your skiing going to change your turn shape and how is it going to turn change your turn shape um, when you have those parameters all set it's pretty hard to go wrong for three hours you need to be conscious of logging what's going on in your body those three points of contact the outside ski the turn shape the when you do the move you need to log that information and that data um, and then make sense of it in the way that you would you know, kind of look at it and say, well, the majority of the time I did get the turn shape that I'm looking for. If you're not hitting some of those measurables, then potentially your understanding of the movement that you're trying to add might be uh, off a little bit, or potentially the movement that you're trying to add may just not be the best one for you at the time. Hopefully that helps. Awesome. Thanks, Warren. I, I did notice a couple of questions about the handout and my apologies, folks. I've um, the handout was there, but I've now posted it. So it's a little bit more visible. So if you're having trouble tracking that down, you should see that now popping up for you. I think that'll probably help uh, Virgilia and uh, Monica with their questions. So if you missed that, by all means, uh, you should now see it in the handout section. Um, and then I uh, did have a couple of people reach out just about um, future topics and uh, future presenters. If you, um, if you know anybody who's interested in presenting or have any future topics, we do have a poll up tonight. Uh, you're welcome to comment on topics you're interested in hearing about at future uh, tech sessions or tech talks. And uh, if you're by, by any chance a presenter who's interested in speaking with uh, members from Ontario and across uh, the country and, and internationally, because we had a few international uh, folks online tonight, we'd love to hear from you. A um, couple last questions. Um, I'm going to publish one from Tracy. So Tracy says, uh, do you have any strategy to get in that zone ready to train? If you find the snow is good and you're not tired, but you're not feeling cognitively ready to train, um, what do you do? Um, this would be different from everyone, uh, for everyone, but, but always good to hear a little bit about what's, you know, what's going on inside your head, Warren. Mm hmm. Wow. Snow's good and you're not tired, but you're not ready to train. <laughs> um, well, I guess at some point you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> that's the that's the easy answer. Um, for me, I go back to my motivation. Right. Why am I here? Why do I want to train? What is it that I want to achieve today? And where is it going to take me in the future? You know, what's it going to do for my skiing? And when you can if you can tie that into an emotion from a previous learning moment, um, you're probably going to fire yourself up pretty quickly. Um, you're going to get into that mindset of, oh, I remember that feeling, that exhilaration, the, the joy, um, you know, the, the control you had for the first time down a, a steep pitch. Um, that's my strategy for going uh, toward remember my motivation and then find a moment in my recent memory or long term memory uh, that built an emotion, uh, remember that moment, because the emotions that in the in the previous positive learning experience or training experience, uh, when you remember that moment, because it was so tied to that emotion, um, the emotions that you'll feel that you felt previously will be as real today as they were then. Awesome. Um, not seeing any new questions pop up so i'll uh i'll pause i'll pause us there for a moment uh really really appreciate everyone being online tonight i think we we're sitting about 105 online on a saturday night um you know great to, great to see people digging in and looking to improve uh on on their weekends and especially when we've got some of the some of the country up on snow uh pretty much everybody on snow by this point but um it, it's great to see um, participation tonight, uh, congrats, uh, BC. We had, we had a ton of people online in BC, Alberta, um, and, and right here in Ontario. So it's great to see the participation from all over the country. I uh, love having everybody again, the 21st of December will be our final tech talk with Warren. Um, that'll be taking place at eight o'clock. Look for an email invite in the next couple of days. It'll also go out by social media. So if you want to tag some people that uh, maybe missed out on the first two, they can definitely check it out. Once you have signed up, you'll get a notification for any previous recordings as well. So you're welcome to soak up content from session number one if you missed it. 
um, or review tonight's session in addition to that. So once again, on behalf of uh, CSI Ontario, myself, AJ Leeming, and, uh, and Warren, really want to thank you all for being here tonight. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week uh, on the 21st. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.